and the only way to incentivize them is to deliver financial incentives straight to their pockets for doing that for changing the way they farm yeah diaspora ki jaan chhod de please jab aur baki sab fail hota hai to pakdo diaspora ko pakdo please when the responsibility has come on amir he says let me go ha huh? a lot of it is about relief rehab reconstruction after disaster so it becomes a disaster conversation and post disaster conversation the other part of it which is a climate change is not really become a national issue around which your society especially your youth mobilize hello and welcome to infer talks a podcast where we put you in the room with some of the biggest thought leaders from around the world today for this special edition we feature lord amir sarfraz who is serving as member house of lords in the uk and dr moeed yusuf vice chancellor beacon house national university and former national security advisor of pakistan Today I'm joined by these two young accomplished leaders to speak about leadership, creating impact, policy making and pursuing your dreams. Gentlemen, welcome to Infer Talks. Thank you. All right, Lord Sarfraz, let's go ahead and uh, start this conversation with you. I would want to go ahead and ask you that you, now that you've been a member of the House of Lords for last few years, someone coming from Pakistan who ended up chasing his dreams becoming a member of the house of lords tell us how was that journey for you like well bismillah wala him thank you so much i really appreciate you you having me and it's it's a always a huge honor to be in the company of dr saab so thank you very much look i i grew up in uh, in in pakistan or at least my my most formative years were in pakistan sort of age 8 to 17 right and so for some reason or the other growing up i had this passion and it wasn't a passion for politics it was a passion for public service it just was it was innate it was always there that's all i wanted to do some people want to build a big business and build a unicorn and have a huge exit uh, others want to do something academic or in sport or play cricket on a team i all i wanted to do was to engage in 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 public service that that that's just you know uh, what i was after and and uh god has been very very kind that many years later in in the uk i was able to uh realize that and uh you know i'm very grateful to the almighty for giving me that that sort of childhood opportunity to do so um and i'm also very grateful to the man who made it happen for me right i mean whatever one might think about him it was really uh, our former chris johnson who who elevated me to the lords and Uh, I, I I owe it to him, and and I take it, you know, extremely seriously as a role. Uh, the House of Lords, unlike the House of Commons, you can make what you want of it. You can put in as much as you want into it, and so I take it extremely seriously, and try and give it, you know, my 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 utmost. And uh, you know, but the whole concept of 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 public service and the passion for that originated very much. in in pakistan where i grew up all right then let me go ahead and ask you my next question and this is primarily about you having been serving in this role for the last few years i want to ask you has your pakistani identity diluted as a result of this how do you manage your commitment to pakistan as someone who has his primary commitment in britain well uh, you're absolutely right that my primary parliamentary responsibilities and duty are in the uk and are, are towards the british people i'm a british parliamentarian uh, you ask about my the pakistani identity and and it has it become any any d- more diluted I, I, you know i think it's really hard to d- dilute a a formative identity of yours at all and i think one doesn't have to sort of pick identities and put yourself in various buckets um i, I am a, a a british parliament trained but i'm also british pakistani i'm a muslim i'm a londoner i'm a dad i'm a i'm a husband i'm all of those things right and so you can you can balance all of those things um however you want to but as far as my pakistani identity is concerned the the, the truth of the matter is i think i still think very much in urdu you know most of the time and i sleep in shalwar kameez and i eat desi khana every night almost 
um, you know, and so that's a big part of of, of my identity. My my Muslim identity is a big part of me as well. I pray five times a day, uh, Alhamdulillah. And so you know, all of those things are not incompatible at all. Doctor Mohit, now let me come to you and ask you a similar kind of a question. Someone you know who has served in multiple identities. You've actually worked both in the United States and Pakistan as well. And let me go ahead and ask you, as a professional, how have you gone ahead? and struck a balance in these two different roles. Thank you, Sama. My experience or journey has not been as smooth as Amir has put it. Uh, I think partly it may be a function of a UK and the number of diaspora in UK and that it's fairly uh, common for Pakistanis and other South Asians and other diaspora, especially from the Commonwealth. Uh, to be able to do what um, you know, many diaspora want to do, and including Amer uh, being a great example. Um, in the U.S., where I spent most of my professional career, I don't think we have that kind of diaspora in the policy world. You've got people, you know, the tons of brilliant doctors and engineers and other professions, but not policy. The other thing with me, the issue um, was that. Uh, the entire time that I was in, in the U.S. Um, professionally, it was a time when the U.S.-Pakistan relationship was a very schizophrenic one. Uh, you had this deep mistrust and angst, and at the same time, Pakistan was in the news every day because it was a frontline ally, Afghanistan, all of that. Um, and so I found a very... Uh, clear sort of um, decision tree uh, or a moment where I had to make a decision. What I found was, unfortunately, and I frankly should, I don't know how much I should be saying here, but where there was a crowd of Pakistan experts who realized that the career progression will be easier or, or your, your existence will be easier if you were to work within the narrative that was promoted uh, in Washington. Uh, and for people like me who actually had, you know, were Pakistani and who understood the system from within, I always thought that my real value to Washington is to honestly explain Pakistan and why Pakistan may be making decisions that it's making and to very honestly and objectively explain to Pakistan why Washington may be choosing things the way they're choosing. Because there was a big wedge between how the two sides approached each other and thought of the decisions taking uh, being taken on the other side, right? If I, to be, uh, I were to be brutally honest, both thought that the other is deliberately uh, misguiding them or lying to them, right? So in that space, I think the toughest path to choose was that you become the advocate for the other side in the opposite capital. But frankly, I thought policy-wise, that was the single best thing I could do and the most professional and ethical and objective thing I could do. It was a difficult path. You know this better than me. You know, uh, all sorts of things said, uh, all sorts of people saying whatever. But I will tell you, Sama, at the end of the day, my experience and lesson is that you can't hide who you are. And you should not try to hide who you are. And if you are a scholar, in my case, you have to be very objective and remove your emotion and talk about what your analysis tells you. And after all these years, I realized something. Even people who disagreed with me vociferously actually ultimately came around to saying, we respect what you were doing. right? And this has been my experience in Pakistan and government as well. You know this. When I came in, uh, tons of commentary around, oh, American and you know, coming from there and he's you know, a plant and whatever is very hurtful, especially when it happens in your own country. But today, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, I must say, uh, many people who started off on that line actually voluntarily came to me later on and said, sorry, uh, we made a mistake. We didn't know, you know, what, what you were doing. So uh, I think you just need to be honest to yourself. These multiple identities do matter. They do exist, but you should just reveal them and let people know who you are. But I don't, I, I wish I had as easy a time as Ahmed did day to day in dealing with that. Um, you know, I, I think it made me a stronger person, but it wasn't as easy. So Dr. Moy, then have you seen any change in terms of, you know, attitude and the perception that people 
have had towards you as a professional and as a person as well someone you know who rose uh, to ranks in the united states working in the policy making circle have you seen a change in the attitude towards uh, this very aspect uh some look i mean i have a principle um for myself at least uh, how do i judge myself uh, especially in today's world post truth world you don't know what's true and what's not my benchmark always has been people who have directly worked with me what do they think of me as a professional as a manager as a colleague right so every time somebody came up with something or says something when you're in public life people are going to say everything yeah amir you can ask him i'm sure there are 50 things when you google him uh, they'll show up my benchmark always is go and ask the people i have worked with in my 20 years if their people think negatively i should introspect and fix that that's a problem i must deal with but people who don't know me who just read a snippet here or talk to somebody and uh, look at youtube there i think you've just got to live with this in public life you should have a thick skin and you should move on while constantly introspecting that you're not making any mistakes so you know there must be people who aren't happy surely but overall i feel there are enough good people who understand and see good work and realize it, right um i in my career have created problems for virtually every employer i've worked with the honest truth is for one reason or another you know sometimes the identity sometimes i'm provocative i'm i'm candid whatever at the end of the day your colleagues and your institution will defend you if they know you're doing good work and you're sincere that's what really matters if you end up pleasing everybody uh, frankly i'll tell you you will be that person who everybody hates because you don't do your own work I don't want to be that. I much rather be provocative and walk out. But even if I spend six months somewhere, I should leave a mark in terms of the performance. Well, Sir Faraz, now let me come towards you and ask you: You've, you know, stayed engaged with your roots here in Pakistan as well. You know, by virtue of your uh, foundation, which is working over here in different parts of the country. Uh, let me then ask you: What exactly is your foundation doing out here, and how are you trying to, you know, stay and do your bit for the community here? so say so my my foundation is is um, simply a way to bring together uh, various small bits of charity activity that that uh, we do as 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 a family with with our own limited resources and so we don't fundraise from any third parties externally etc this is whatever one can afford to do and to put it into a um a, a mechanism which is a bit more structured and formal etc and measures impact etc my my dear uh, uh grandmother was was a, a village philanthropist um in gujarat where where uh, she lived and uh, my my father uh, did a whole lot of uh philanthropy in in his time and so I, i decided to carry on and focus on a few few areas and these are areas that you know my wife and i we uh, care about a whole lot i think the one i'm most proud of and excited about in pakistan is is equine therapy riding therapy for special needs children and this was something which i saw in the us um at a ranch in 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 texas and i was totally blown away by these children with cognitive and physical uh additional needs when they put them on, on a horse there's something about sitting on a horse that the almighty has given in which you know if any of us sit on a horse you sit in a different posture etc you know and, and so it's type of therapy for special needs children it's also a form of entertainment and it's a bit of a break for their parents as well and you don't have those outlets readily available in pakistan for parents um of of children with with additional needs so so we set up a a center in islamabad for therapy um and we've got i think 80 85 children now and uh three horses and 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 so and so it's free for the kids and we love it and and the kids love it and the parents love it and we're just expanding now to karachi inshallah and then we'd like to do uh, every city um so so expanding to karachi for for equine therapy super excited about that we've got some great instructors from the uk who are the master trainers for the pakistani instructors who then deliver the training to children in 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 Pakistan is really unique i love it and and you know i invite everyone all your viewers to come and watch it and be part of it it's it's great so that's a whole lot of fun i really enjoyed the other the other few things 
Um, I, I realized that in Pakistan, in prisons, there are many prisons that when women go in there and are um, uh, arrested, they take their children uh, with them because they have nowhere to leave their children. And these can be sort of very young infants and toddlers, etc. And I just thought, I have, I have kids. And if my kid drops something on the ground, you know, I sanitize it and give it back to them. And so what would it be like for these kids in, 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 in prison uh, who are there of no fault of their own? And, and so we work with a lot of prisons to deliver sort of essential items to the kids over there. Um, you know, and, and basic stuff that you, you know, nappies and rash creams and, and uh, calpol and all kinds of things that they need. Um, and so that, you know, do, do a bit of that. We do a whole lot of stuff in, in rural areas, uh, a whole bunch of stuff um, uh, working with, particularly with uh, younger women and girls in rural areas, in farming communities, uh, delivering them vocational training and then giving them opportunities after that training to set up their own businesses, giving them that that sort of seed capital or, 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 or loans to do that. One of the things that we did in, in farming communities, we saw that there were lots of kids on farms and that wasn't because they were child labor. It was because their mums had nowhere again to leave them while they were out working on the fields. And so we set up these things called community mother centers in rural areas, which is like a daycare center where mums leave their kids uh, for the day and we do sports with them and we do uh, uh, normal sort of day, day, daily educational lessons, etc. And we do that for the, the season in which they're out working in the field. So you know, the, the paddy growing season, etc. And and that's been very, very uh, rewarding as well. So, so we do whatever we think is most impactful, mostly in rural areas. Um, and and we, 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 we try and fund it ourselves, which is why we can't be very big because it's all kind of self um, self-sustaining uh, but it gives it gives us a whole lot of satisfaction so lord lord Amir, sir Fraz, let me ask you one more question i think you know being someone as a multifaceted uh, person you know we've uh, spoken about your side of the personality as a legislator then as a philanthropist and now i want to ask you someone who also has a shade of entrepreneurial spirit as well and let me ask you you know you were also a founder of this company called Net Zero Agriculture, which provides tech-based solutions in the agribusiness. Uh, could you tell us a bit about that uh, initiative? And are you also undertaking any uh, measures in Pakistan under this company of yours? Yeah, so Net Zero Ag is, is a business that uh, I, I founded many years ago. It's been about 11 years now. And the entire thesis of this is that uh, smallholder farmers, particularly across Asia, uh, don't get the technological support that they need. Uh, whereas big uh, agricultural companies, the John Deere's of the world, design products and tractors and sensors for big farmers in Iowa or in, in Europe, etc. Smallholder farmers really don't get enough uh, attention. And the area that that we're focusing on. Uh, a whole lot. We've got it's a small organization, about 100, 120 employees, is all around the uh, climate change challenges for smallholder farmers. So we've seen that smallholder farmers across Asia have been right at the forefront of being affected by climate change. 2023 was a, a particularly unfortunate year, ranging from droughts to floods to everything else, and a lot of loss of, 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 of human beings and also of, of land. Uh, so they're, 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 they're dealing with, with climate change as victims, but also they are contributing to uh, greenhouse gas emissions, particularly those who are growing rice. Uh, rice is the second largest emitter of methane uh, in the agricultural world after cow uh, releases. And so, so cows eat food and then they burp that's that's the number one agricultural source of methane emission and then after that it's it's rice farming so if you were to go into a rice farm you can actually see when it's flooded you can see little bubbles of water and that's pure methane being released into the atmosphere so it's you know you have a smallholder farmer who's growing rice and this is being released in the atmosphere and then they're also victims of that same um uh, phenomena and so we thought we'd deal with that sort of head-on 
and and help train uh, tens of thousands of smallholder farmers on different farming techniques which reduce their greenhouse gas uh, footprints. And we've been doing that for a while. I think in the world of rice, I think our small business has become perhaps the most impactful uh, in the world. And uh, uh, alhamdulillah, a lot of a, a lot of that work has been done in Pakistan. We have thirty five thousand smallholder farmers in Pakistan that we work with. And, you know, rice emissions don't get the same headlines as aviation emissions, for example, but they're just as much as aviation emissions. So you can take a, you know, an easy jet flight and you can offset your emissions. But if you're eating rice, you can't. You know, people complain in, 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 in Davos when everyone gets together for the World Economic Forum, they're looking at their, their planes and saying they've flown in from here and there and they get very upset. But they don't get upset when, when, they're, when they're eating rice, even though they, you know, their emissions might be more in, in, in rice consumption. So uh, we've trained these farmers, but it's not enough to train them. You have to incentivize them. And the only way to incentivize them is to deliver financial incentives straight to their pockets for doing that, for changing the way they farm. They need to get paid. And so who's going to pay them for changing the way they farm? And this is a tough one. So if you go right now to a, a store in, in London and say to consumers, which we've done at many times, you know, would you pay a premium for uh, rice, which is sustainably grown? The answer is no. There's a, and you can't blame people. There's a cost of living crisis everywhere in the world. They want the cheapest product, but they also want it sustainably grown. So who's going to pick up the bill for it? It's really difficult to come up with a model. And that's what we think we've cracked. We've come up with a model in which farmers get paid um, for changing the way they farm. And the way we're doing that is by disintermediating the voluntary carbon market and giving smallholder farmers for the first time access to carbon offsets directly to their wallets. That's never happened before. Um, and that's, that's what we're doing. And Alhamdulillah, I think we've, we've, we've done it very well so far. Uh, it requires a lot of tech in order to deliver. So if you want to... Uh, prove so if, if you know you're a company and you've made a, 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 a declaration that you've reduced methane emissions in your supply chain by so much, you want to be able to evidence that and you want to make sure it's been done and rooted in deep science. And so, the tech that we've developed helps companies monitor and measure their, their emissions in, 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 in agricultural um, uh, context. And so, for example, we use satellite instruments in order to see down to the farm level what the water level is at any given time in a, in a, in a farm. Uh, we then have ground sensors. We develop them from scratch. You know, we've developed them from with the, with our own circuit boards, lidar sensors, etc., to see the water levels at farms. We take that data and we triangulate it with data from farms. And I think we generate the highest quality data that anyone does in the world and in the world on, on uh, methane reductions by smallholder farmers. And again, Pakistan is right at the forefront of, of this. Dr. Mohit, your team was actually at the helm when the national security policy came out and climate change was certainly among, you know, those very aspects that was underscored in Pakistan's national security. Then let me ask you, uh, how would, you know, businesses like these be, be critical in terms of, you know, tackling issues of carbon emissions, even in a country like Pakistan? Some of my uh, personal view on this, I mean, obviously, you know that climate is now part of the national security paradigm. If you do comprehensive national security, whether it's a national security policy or otherwise, and it has to be. I mean, we're one of the most vulnerable countries. And frankly, there is no uh, debate left on this. We are seeing it in Pakistan year after year now. You don't have to have the kind of massive floods we did. Just look at the rain cycle. Uh, just look at the kind of melting of the glaciers and the data around that. Um, you know, droughts, you can just, you can see it every day. Um, now, are we changing our zoning patterns? Are we changing our cropping patterns? Are we, our yields are actually abysmal compared to even uh, our neighborhood, right? And are we being sustainable in how we do this? Uh, the answer is, frankly, I think in climate, we've had a lot of policy discussion. A lot of it is about relief, uh, rehab, reconstruction after disaster. So it becomes a disaster conversation and post-disaster conversation. The other part of it, I think we're still missing, which is that climate change has not really become a national issue around which 
your society, especially your youth, uh, mobilize. We'll mobilize around, you know, other very important things like corruption. We'll mobilize around politics. We'll mobilize around inflation. But climate, many countries now have it right up there in terms of the emotive and the sensitive and the societal and social. We are not there yet. So unless and until you can tie up bottom-up pressure with this change at the top, which is climate is now a national security issue, we've got to deal with it. I don't think you're going to see the results at the business level that you're talking about. Um, you know, think about this. Lahore, the city of Lahore, which I belong to and now live in, um, it's one of the most polluted cities in the world in certain seasons of the year, right? Um, and one of the big reasons behind, or one of the reasons behind that has been crop burning patterns. Um, and crop burning is, is banned. I mean, it's illegal. Uh, you have brick kilns, which are illegal in, in, in certain ways in certain parts around here. But you can enforce it as a legal law enforcement issue. You still haven't convinced people of the environmental value of doing things differently. These two have to be done together. A policy, a national security policy can't change mindsets. Uh, that can only force enforcement. You've now got to start changing mindsets. And for that, there has to be a national narrative around the importance of climate change and sustainability beyond just conferences in big hotels or conversations in the international forum. Moid, now, Dr. Moid, let me go you ahead. You know, the and one I'm... thing that, that sure. bothers me on, 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 on this is that um, Dr. Saab mentioned crop burning, right? And, and so crop burning is a huge problem and a huge public health risk. But uh, it's not enough to ban it. You, you have to give viable, zero-cost alternatives to smallholder farmers. And we haven't done that yet. We've told them it's really bad for you and you can use this different type of melter and you can use this type of cutter and do that. But actually, burning it, it makes financial sense. And you see, this is, this is the issue. Many of these methodologies and standards for uh, climate haven't taken into account the views, and I care about smallholder farmers, so which is why I talk mostly about them, of smallholder farmers at all. Uh, you know, I, 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 I go and speak at climate conferences all the time, and I've never seen a smallholder farmer attend any of them. And, and none of these methodologies, standards, you take, you know, all of these big global standards for sustainability and sustainable rice and sustainable wheat and sustainable sugar, you know, how many smallholders have been involved in, in developing them? And, and so I, I, I generally think that um, folks have had enough of these, these documents being written in Europe and shoved down the throats of smallholders in Asia and Africa. It has to be reversed now. I couldn't agree more, Osama. Let me just say, I, I think you're absolutely right, Amr. I mean, this is exactly the point. Even uh, go a level higher in terms of aggregation. The entire world is talking about climate mitigation, new technologies. What about countries like Pakistan that are still in the adaptation phase? I mean, we are facing this here. We need support in adaptation. The entire conversation has moved on to something else, right? That's the policy space. The other one, you're absolutely right. Look, there's a development process, right? The entire world uh, has gone through this where development has happened and then climate uh, awareness has come and now there are very stringent climate uh, rules, regulations and norms that are being brought in still very much from the developed world to the developing world. Uh, but then within the developing world, there is this issue that you can ad adapt and adopt, but what alternatives are you providing? Uh, frankly, both small and large farmers. At the end of the day, it's the job of states to provide that avenue through which they're going to do that. So I think Amit's point is absolutely well taken. My only issue is there is a lot of climate education that is required all around. Unless you do that, uh, I don't think just a policy and just making it a national security issue is going to make the kind of difference we are looking for. That said, let me also say, I think it's very unfair to keep talking about Pakistan as the world sometimes has, um, as, oh, climate, yeah, 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 they're vulnerable, oh, there's a flood. But there is a larger climate change problem, and we are at the front end of bearing the brunt of it. And I think it's really the responsibility of the world to own countries like Pakistan, there are others as well, uh, who are actually suffering because of uh, lavish lifestyles and bad practices of many other countries in the world 
uh, through the previous centuries, frankly. Wait, let me ask you a very important... You know, the, 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 the fact is, the, the, um, uh, sorry to uh, interrupt our moderator, but look, the, the, the <clears throat> fact is, and look, I have no political affiliations at all as in terms of Pakistan whatsoever. I get on with everyone, every shade, every party, everything. Um, but the um, the specific climate interventions of the previous government were actually really well received. I'm talking about the tree planting efforts were really well received uh, everywhere in, in the world. It was actually quite a flagship project. I mean, really exciting stuff that they were doing. And um, uh, and I think the, the, the government just passed, uh, continued uh, uh, that and worked on other things as well. But I think that Pakistan has has missed a trick here because Pakistan was in the headlines across the world on what you were doing for, in terms of climate change and tree planting. And I think the government spent too much time engaging with these the soft donors and all of these DFIs and MFI, all these people who are a complete waste of time. The, all the folks who came to your climate conference and made pledges of billions of dollars, you know, uh, instead of engaging with the private sector, the, the global sort of private climate capital, who I think would have been really interested in Pakistan because you're actually leading in some of that stuff and you could have really innovated around products. So, you know, you have investors coming in and, you know, you pay them in cash, not only cash dividends, but climate offset, voluntary offsets as, as, as dividends as, as, as well. And so Pakistan hasn't yet tapped into the sort of global asset base of, of investors who are looking to invest private sector in climate. So my, my appeal is uh, to your government is to stop wasting time with DFIs, World Bank types, IMF types, IFC types, all of them, and, and even some of the sovereign wealth funds. Forget it and focus on the rest of the world who who I think you can engage with on climate particularly uh, and climate technologies particularly. I tell you, I did this tour of one of these universities in Pakistan. And I, I mean, these young entrepreneurs developing tech, domestic tech, which is sort of rural ready, low cost little climate solutions, super, super exciting stuff. None of that has been monetized at all. That's all up for grabs. So Dr. Mohit, now let me come to you about this very important issue of climate change. You know, someone who's actually worked in non-profit sector, universities, you know, think tank sector, and also the government, uh, an issue as important as climate change, and you earlier mentioned the point that, you know, we need more active diaspora in places like the United States, where instead of, you know, just following other professions, they should also opt for policymaking as well, or policymaking professions. How do you think diaspora can really be useful in bringing about that different perspective about the global south or about countries like Pakistan that are among the highest vulnerable countries when it comes to climate change itself. Yeah, diaspora ki jaan chhod den please. Chhod den diaspora ko. Jab aur baki sab fail hota hai to pakdo diaspora ko pakdo. Please. When when the responsibility has come on Amir, he says, "Let me go." Huh? Uh, I get it. Uh, <laughs> I. Um, Diaspora has been a lifeline at the end of the day. Uh, remittance is actually not a joke for Pakistan, right? So, voto ek hai. But, but let me say this. I don't think you can get diaspora in this space in any big way. I think you can get champions within the diaspora who care about this. But diaspora is mostly, Pakistani diaspora is focused mostly on philanthropy and uh, opening up doors for Pakistan in terms of narratives and conversations and, and politics and international stature. I don't see the diaspora mobilizing around these issues en masse. So I wouldn't spend too much energy there. I would find champions and sort of work with them. Really, Osama, at the end of the day, my own sense is the world gets the fact that Pakistan is struggling, but there's a bit of a unsaid, uh, hidden sort of secret here. Pakistan is not a polluter. Uh, so I'll tell you one conversation, at least I remember uh, having with somebody who muttered. It was, look, I mean, you are not dirty enough and you're not big enough. So if you were really polluting, we'll come and talk to you and figure a way out. 
you're not polluting that much. Yes, you're vulnerable and we'll give you assistance for that. So we're kind of stuck in this odd situation. We are clean. We should be dirtier. No. But if you're not dirtier, nobody pays you attention. So it's it's an odd sort of dynamic. But that said, I think uh, there is now no doubt that Pakistan's going to suffer along with other countries economically and physically. And ultimately, it's going to lead to a societal issue um, because of forced migration internally if climate change is not addressed. It is also true we don't have the kind of resources we need. And that's why I think Pakistan, the state has been absolutely right in reaching out to the world and saying we really do need your help. Now, the world is also right in saying, give us a plan, give us a strategy, tell us exactly what you want to do. So it's, you know, you've got to clap with both hands. But but I do think this is going to be a bigger and bigger and bigger issue as, as we go forward. And Bilkul Diaspora ki jani chodni hai, they need to continue helping us. Or Jo Abhi apne ye sovereign wealth fund Pakistan mein banaya hai. Uh, you know, you, you're very lucky that you're getting to create a sovereign wealth fund from scratch in 2023, right? I mean, it's incredible. Nobody else is getting to do that. Everyone has yeah. created their sovereign wealth fund. Yeah. And so you can make a really kind of forward-looking uh, sovereign wealth fund. And I think it should have climate right, left, and center. Yeah. And it should be called, actually, I think it should be called the Pakistan Sovereign Climate Fund, honestly. Uh, you can at least get into debt swaps in that conversation. Plus, you know, carbon um, it really should be one of the big, big parts of this. That that part is, I agree with that. Now, Lord Amir, let me come towards you and ask you that, you know, as a member of the House of Lords, you're actually part of two active committees. Uh, the first is the Joint Committee on National Security Strategy. And the other one is the AI Weapon System Select Committee. Where do you exactly see the future of this uh, committee on the AI uh, weapons, uh, not the committee itself, but the but the role of the AI weapons. Uh, you know, speaking about the global landscape, and then on the implementation of the national security strategy, what would be the key most priority areas for the United King Kingdom in the years to come? How do you want me to change my mental gear from smallholder <laughs> farmers to <laughs> missile system, AI and missile systems? But look, I you know um, we can talk about it all day. But what's really interesting, uh, and this is a total change of gear, but what's totally really interesting is is uh, how we regulate for AI across defense, right? And so th there's been this moment, the chat GPT moment, in which now everyone is an expert on AI. Everyone, you know, everyone is talking about AI and lawmakers as well. Everyone is now interested in uh, following a AI. And I think that's an opportunity to legislate in a very thoughtful way, particularly when it comes to defense. So you know that AI will have applications in every industry in a massive way, probably healthcare in a totally game-changing way, and then everything else, right? Uh, defense is where th there, there are two bits of it. One is the benign bit, Things like predictive maintenance. There's an aircraft which generates, uh, you know, a terabyte of data every hour. You know, I mean, that much data being generated with literally hundreds and hundreds of sensors on any aerial platform. And so, uh, much of that data is not needed, but you have to develop insights from that data in order to uh, make sure you can deliver predictive maintenance months months in advance. Similarly, sort of supply chains, making them more efficient in defense. All of the back office stuff, I think that there's no issue around. Where it gets sensitive is how much AI will be used in autonomous weapon systems. So you have uh, drone swarms, for example. You can't have a drone swarm function without some level of AI in terms of situational awareness and geographical awareness. So you, you already have a lot of that happening. But when it actually comes to launching a weapon, do you ever want AI to make that decision or not? And that is what the question really is right now. How much human involvement must there be? And you know, our view and my view is that there must be a whole lot of human involvement. We don't want machines making those decisions. But we have to agree uh, internationally on, on the definition of autonomous weapon systems and have to agree on the interpretation of existing humanitarian law uh, as it relates to, to AI. 
And I think these are sort of really big issues in the UK and the US and many other countries, uh, NATO as well, are taking it really very, very seriously. And um, uh, you know, this is a topic in which we will need to engage with the Chinese, for example, because they have to, they have to be on board uh, this definition and they have to be on board the same ethical standards that, that we all want to hold ourselves to. And so it's a really, really interesting area and there's lots of kind of bits of detail to it, right? How do you share data between uh, de defense organizations, between countries? How do you make sure there's standards uh, uh, to do that? You know, what bit of the human involvement becomes reliant on AI? Uh, how do you make sure the skills are there for military commanders, but also policymakers? Because in our systems, you'd be you know, surprised that any time there's a, a weapon released of any form, the military commander has to take advice from two areas other than defense. So they must take legal advice and they must take policy advice, right? And so, you know, how much AI will you have in these sort of decisions to launch weapon systems? It's all really interesting. And I think we're operating at the kind of, uh, edge of ethics and technology. And we've got to be really careful to regulate this properly right now. So I'm spending a lot of time thinking about that and I find it fascinating. And Dr. Mohit, let me come to you. Where do you actually see the future of AI in Pakistan and also the fact now that you're out of office? How do you see the implementation of the national security policy itself? First of all, if Amir wants uh, a copy, uh, I'm happy to provide it. You can just copy it. It's really good. <laughs> um, look, I think on, on AI, uh, it's the future. You know, this whole debate about good, bad, we should uh, adopt, we shouldn't, uh, we should allow, we should disallow, even in the education sector that I sit in now, you know, huge debate about can you use chat, uh, use chat GPT or not? Can you? Once technology is out there in today's world, uh, you're living in fool's paradise if you think you can just close your eyes and hide and force people not to use it. Question is, how do you use it constructively, right? So um, technology ultimately is value neutral till you use it in the right or wrong way. AI is here to stay. How do we benefit from it as much as possible? We can't be regressive about this, in my view. Yes, you have to create rules and responsibilities and new rights and new cultures around and new norms, but that's going to happen over time. You cannot be a country, a, a city, a family or a university just choosing to stay out of something that's truly going to become the driving force in how humans operate with each other and interact with each other. Especially uh, on the weapon side, you know, as a student, we used to study in so political science, the RMAs, the revolution, uh, revolution in military affairs. Well, this is a revolution, a revolution in mankind, uh, in, 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 in sort of the history, probably one of the biggest revolutions in the history of mankind in that sense. Um, and I personally think that the, the whole face of war is going to transform completely. You are going to end up in 50 years without humans having to lose lives. Uh, that, in a way, is, of course, very good. On the other hand, the threshold for going into war and continuing war and violence uh, probably comes down because you're not le losing human life. So, I mean, uh, you know, I think those are questions for later, but, but I do think this is here to stay. As far as uh, the NSP is concerned, I don't know. I'm not in office, uh, you know, what was happening with implementation. Look, Osama, my point on NSP is always very simple. It was a consensus decision. We needed a document in a direction. The direction is there. It's not perfect. People who don't like it can change it. People who like it and the system now has to implement it because it, it's an approved policy. I don't see any disagreement. Everybody's been talking about human security and economic security. These are long-term things. They are going to happen. How they happen ultimately uh, you know, depends on uh, whoever is in power at that time. What I'm convinced by is I haven't heard a single person who says Pakistan did not need to take its national security conversation towards comprehensive national security. That's where it is. Uh, unfortunately, um, we didn't get um, uh, time to um, create a, a model in which there is this conversation would end, whether it's going to continue, whether it's going to be implemented. 
But I'm sure um, as people go along and as um, rulers look at it and have looked at it, I haven't seen any major objection to the direction it has, which I think is good news for Pakistan. Dr. Mohit and Lord Amir, I have a question for both of you. You know, being as young people uh, and, you know, having assumed roles of leadership, I'm sure, you know, when you are on the table, you must have overcome or, in fact, uh, come over uh, reluctance on part of senior members on the table. So, you know, how have you both sort of navigated that complexity when it comes to making them more amenable in terms of whatever suggestion or advice you bring when it comes to, dis uh, you know, discussing or deliberating on a certain issue? Oh, I don't think Dr. Saab is that much senior in age that I feel that way today at all. No, no, he's <laughs> young and that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, getting white, look, getting white. Getting white. As um, the the uh, the House of Lords, the average age is seventy one, and I joined when I was uh, thirty eight, and I was w one of the youngest by far. And the big advantage I had there was that I had grown up in Pakistan, and therefore. I know how to treat elders with the utmost respect and regard. And that was, for me, my sort of secret superpower. Uh, and it works brilliantly because, actually, I'm very lucky to get to sit with these folks who are absolutely in their industries, in their field, people who have changed the world, right, in, in arts and in science and uh, in their careers. It's really fascinating people. And, and so uh, you have a lot you can learn from them and uh, the the there's a whole bunch of eastern values which i think are you know nuggets of of wisdom that you have in and 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 in your sort of toolkit to 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 use and i think we overlook those sometimes one of them is your regard for elders but then also how we care for um, our elders when they get older etc I believe, you know, these these Eastern uh, values have, for me personally, have have hugely helped me in a really meaningful way. Dr. Boyd? Um, look, I mean, professionally, I've been in that in that position throughout my career, right? I mean, um, youngest this and youngest that in every room I entered policy-wise, I was dealing with people my uh, parents' age or, or more. I mean, you know, getting into a policy room as a 25-year-old and you've got somebody who's uh, 80 years old and has seen the world, done things, been a former this and that and whatever. It was intimidating to begin with, frankly. Uh, over time, I got used to it. Uh, and I think um, I would second Amir's thing. You know, I didn't have any qualms about um, our um, experienced people telling me in a room saying, take notes or can you get me tea? It's okay. I mean, you know, as, as casually. And I, 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 that's fine. But over time, I've realized two things. Younger people like myself and Amir should never assume that anybody's over the hill. There is no substitute for experience. I think the kind of things you can pick up from them, the kind of narratives, the kind of conversations, you know, you just can't be a wholesome professional without that. Um, at the same time, I think the world has changed a lot in the past 30 years, 40 years or so, definitely since the advent of the internet. Um, and so, yes, you do struggle with that, where uh, seniors sometimes will feel, you know, new kid on the block, what are you doing here? Um, this problem I hardly had in the US. The US is not hierarchical by age. There could be other um you know, professional issues, but not age. Uh, Pakistan, yes, we are hierarchical, so you deal with it, but respect goes a long way, and I think Amir is right. My biggest problem in my career, Osama, is a big weakness I have, and I've just not overcome it, and I, I don't think I should. I can live with everything, but I can't live with inefficiency. Uh, status quo kills me in every possible way. So I'm a bit of a disruptor, if you will, and where you get into a room with low energy, where people are spending time defending the status quo, I just, that, I, I can't take it. And so you can imagine sometimes what government would be like. 
um, you know, because there's a lot of um, so emphasis on status quo. I remember, I all, <laughs> always used to say, just don't utter the word precedent in my presence. Because precedent is the best way for a system, a public sector system to say, I don't want to change. I'm not saying don't look at precedent. It's important, all of that. But so many times you would forestall change by saying, oh, the precedent doesn't allow. So as long as people are willing to change, I'm okay. But I now have a problem. I've never dealt with people younger than me. So I'm struggling to learn that. I'm very comfortable with people who are older because that's what, what I've done all my life. The new generation is actually a very interesting one. And I'm, I'm, I've learned a lot over my career, but being in a university now, dealing with you know that age group of 18 to 22, 20, uh, it's a different generation. Uh, the kind of ideas, creativity, confidence, entitlement, good and bad, it all comes together. It creates a very interesting mix and a very beautiful mix, I think. And that's one where I now have to bring uh my learning but anytime any of us think we know everything the elders don't or the younger generation doesn't i think we're in trouble so lord amir and dr you know, the other thing is that that older older people uh much older elder, elderly folks they they also feel intimidated when they're younger people yeah. there uh, and, yeah. and and uh you know one has to just be careful about that they feel the same way it's it works yeah. both ways yeah, that's true. I think that's exactly right. That's exactly right. But at the end of the day, you've also got now 30-year-olds, 25-year-olds running countries and running them perfectly and 80-year-olds running countries perfectly. So I think age is just a number in this case. You've got to be respectful. You've got to learn from them. And you've got to politely tell them where you think that, you know, change has to come uh, no matter what. Dr. Moida and Lord Amir, since age is just a number, what advice would you then give to both the public and the corporate sector to include more younger voices or younger people in senior positions to create opportunities for masses? Uh, I say age is just a number, Osama, now. Because I think we are now getting to the stage where age, not you, but Amir and me, where age actually should be just a number. Otherwise, we get depressed. I'm telling you, I'm getting white now, uh, beginning to. So, um, look, corporate sector actually does fairly well. This problem uh, arises more in the public sector. Uh, where I think, you know, it still matters on how many years you have where um, and, and how you get somewhere, which is okay. But at the end of the day, innovation doesn't come from a number called age, right? I mean, that's what, what you've got to bring in. And I've been a big fan of uh, every public sector opening up space for 25-year-olds to come and do maverick things and give new ideas and break and rebuild. That's what I said, right? I just can't live with uh, poor status quo. Uh, that's just a weakness I have. Um, I one of the maverick, the wildest fictional thoughts I have is that we've tried everything in Pakistan. How about a government in which every single person is below the age of 40? If you don't get different results, you can do whatever you want. I don't know whether it'll be better or worse, but they'll be very different. The point I'm making is we should respect experience and the the elder generation should know that creativity can come at any age. You've just got to find the right people. Lord, I mean, uh, let me also say, sorry, let me also say, every day I learn from students at BNU. I'm not joking. Anybody I speak to has got an idea that I've not thought of. So this is the power of the new generation. I mean, there's so many, so many case studies. You go now to Riyadh. And you go to the uh, MISC Foundation, the Crown Prince's Foundation offices in Riyadh. I think they're in the diplomatic quarter. And you go there, and I tell you the energy that you feel over there, because it's full of younger women working there. And uh, it's just a demonstration of how old institutional place can completely change if you know, younger women are allowed to flourish and thrive, and they really, really are. And so there's many out there. But the one sort of message I have, which is an appeal to younger folks in, in Pakistan, and I really mean this, is, you know, uh, I, I, I think that there's um, a lot of content that's consumed in Pakistan, social media content, which um, is, is consumed, which is unhealthy. 
it's the case over here in the UK as well, in the, in the case in every, everywhere in the world. But in Pakistan, the manifestation is in, you know, the sort of political content you, you get on WhatsApp whenever I'm visiting Pakistan, videos and theories and conspiracies and everything. And, you know, it's a huge distraction from things like changing the world and doing sort of great things for your community and your family and yourself and your country. And uh, if there's a route uh, and a path to reducing uh, the time spent on the consumption of nonsensical content, which is absolutely of no use to anyone, that would be very, very healthy and very good. And we all, you know, I have children, we, everyone will struggle with, with that. But in Pakistan, it's, you know, the, 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 the fear is there's so much negative content that folks consume that it affects the national uh, mental health. Here we have similar issue with, with different types of, of, of content. We just had the online safety bill go through parliament in, 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 in the UK, and it was really tough. It took a very long time. And, and it, it started off as a document this big, and it became a document which was this, this thick on all the different sorts of things that need to be regulated online. And, you know, and then problems that have not, not even started yet, particularly with AI and, you know, um, uh, all of the stuff that's yet to come. And so I think that is that is a challenge. And then the other bit of that is, is you know, disinformation, misinformation and and um, the consumption of, of that. And, you know, I hope there's some clever BNU students who are working on software and tools and apps which helps you know what's fake and what's not immediately you know as soon as it shows up on your whatsapp feed and, and so these are massive destruction distractions none, none of the great innovators and entrepreneurs of the world will tell you that they sat on their sofa all day and listened to you know youtube of pakistanis in london and elsewhere talking about conspiracy theories around the government dr mohit what what advice would you actually give to the youth as well you know, if they want to go ahead and, you know, create opportunities or share their promising ideas to help build sustainable and prosperous societies. Uh, it's a difficult one. So I'm not sure it's only about students. I mean, youth in uh, as a whole, we have to look at Pakistan. I mean, you know, we have been thinking about creating a center for character building, talking about civics, talking about citizenry. All of this comes under that. But I think it's underpinned by a social contract, right? Regulation works when you have a strong social contract between state and society. Otherwise, it's resented. So I think this is a deeper conversation. But my message to youth always is very simple. Just work hard and work sincerely on whatever you are doing. I have one um, lesson that I've learned in my life, at least. Even the worst... Uh, examples of people who may not be ones to emulate, may have broken the law, may have done things the wrong way. And those who are, you know, as good as it gets in role models. I, I've never seen, you can be entitled, born with a golden spoon, etc. Even there, somebody else will get ahead of you if they're working harder. Uh, and of course, you don't want to be on the wrong side of of anything in terms of law, morals, and ethics. And thus, you move away from that category and the role model category. You've got to work hard and you've got to work sincerely. You have these two qualities. Any profession, anything you do, you'll make it. That's been my experience in that, inshallah. And, you know, to add to that, um, my experience has been different. My experience has been that... that um, you know, the hard work and smart folks and all of that, there's, there's a lot. But, there, if, you know, if you really, really want something strong enough, deep enough, you really, really want it, there's a way to get it. There's a, there's a metaphysical something at work. Yeah. And if you really have a passion for something, it can happen. And that, you know, that manifests in in prayer for most of us, but it has to be, you know, a really deep, deep one. And, and I, I experienced it myself. I, I, I wanted to be a parliamentarian no matter what. That's what I wanted. 
I didn't care what I didn't care about anything, which where, what party, what nothing. I just that's what I wanted. And I tell you, you want it hard enough and and you focus on it hard enough and it happens. It it really does. That's faith. Hardcore faith. I mean, can it happen without hard work? You've got to work for it. Yeah, I mean, yes. dekh le, hum, dekh le, mein, uh, you know, uh, hard, 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 hard work. I, I, look, I, 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 I tell people, I tell people that you're absolutely right. Of course, it can't happen with hard work. But I tell people, you know, that everyone asks me, how did you get into the house of law? Right? And so, look, there were people who worked harder than I did. For sure, they worked harder. There are people who are much smarter than I am. I mean, there's no question about it, right? You know, but I prayed harder than everyone else. <laughs> I, honestly, I did. I prayed harder than anyone else. They couldn't outpray me, and and but I'm absolutely with you. Look, uh, I'm the sort of person who's who works seven days a week uh, on holiday any time, other than when I'm asleep. I'm working in somewhere or the other. So you're absolutely absolutely right. But you know, Doctor Saab, the the thing is, my, my point is that pe people don't find their passion uh, soon enough. I agree with and, you. And you know, if you don't find your passion, you re your real passion. Uh, then your 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 hard work is being sort of misapplied. Yeah, I and think so that's if fair. You're yeah. able to find that, yeah, I think that's fair. And you know, the world I'm living in right now. One of the things I always tell parents now is: gone are the days where you can force your kids to become lawyers, engineers, and doctors. Let them find their calling, because otherwise they're going to be miserable doctors. Even what's if they're your really calling? What's what's your work. passion that you found? What is what is your passion, Doctor Sam? Tell us. <laughs> Yeah, that's the that's the parliamentarian speaking. No, honestly, I mean, if I were to honestly answer, I yeah. have a I don't know obsession with public service, which I've now tried. Uh, I did, but I I mean, I actually am the kind of person who lives to to see how I can do something larger than just myself or my job or make make money around it. So. For me, the university is also a way to change society. Uh, my previous job was as well. Frankly, my years in, in Washington uh, and the US were also because you're contributing to that conversation of, of policy. That's what gives me fulfillment. Uh, but every person is different. My only point is find that and have, don't underestimate the value of happiness. Don't only think of a marker that the society will think is making you successful. Know for yourself what success is and be content. There is no point being a miserable billion. Trust me, there is no point. Osama, what is your passion? Oh, that's that's an interesting one. I think I somehow share, I must say, a bit of a middle course uh, when it comes to, you know, the words that you two gentlemen actually share. A bit of uh, policy making and to also help, you know, make better environments by virtue of you know creating better policies uh, and also in a way I would somehow want to be engaged with uh, the corporate sector as well because at the end of the day I think not just the policies we also need to have some brilliant ideas that need to be pulled through that can impact the lives of uh, you know the masses in a bit productive manner as well. I think Osama has never been asked a question by a guest so next time you should offer Ahmed. He'll be a very good anchor. Let's give that a shot. Um, I'm happy to do that. Thank you so much, Lord Ahmed Safraz, Dr. Moeed Yusuf. It's been a pleasure hosting both of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much for staying with us through this conversation with Lord Ahmed Safraz and Dr. Moeed Yusuf. Our team works very hard to make this work possible. And it would mean the world to us if you could like and share our content to show your support. And if you'd like to stay informed on upcoming podcasts and other work, please hit the bell icon.